Dean, welcome back to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me back. Apparently, I didn't offend anyone the last time, so uh, here we are again. No, but we've got we got another episode, so we can do our best if that is the challenge, or you know, we can avoid it if that is not what we're going for. Up up to you, really, whichever direction you want to go in. So, well, I'll try to be inoffensive then. So, uh... okay, okay. Well, it has only been about six months since we last spoke, but I'm wondering. What have been the biggest changes for you in that time, both personally and professionally? Well, uh, my wonderful, beloved golden retriever came down with pneumonia, and I didn't even know dogs could get pneumonia. So uh, she ended up with that, and it went on for four to five months uh, with all kinds of complications. But now she's been... uh, pneumonia free for a couple of months and prancing around like a puppy and uh, she'll probably be at the door whining at any minute. Yeah. Uh, so that was the biggest change. And uh, I finished uh, a, a book called The Bad Weather Friend, which comes out in January and another book that we're trying to get a title on. Um, and we have a new book out today, actually. So uh, it's been busy. I've kept out of trouble with the cops, and that's my name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's probably for the best. And I, I mean, since since you've got another book that will be coming out in January as well, so the bad weathered friend. Are you looking at putting out two books a year? Is that kind of what's going on? Is that I, I suppose you don't need a strategy as such, being Dean Koontz, but is that just naturally the rhythm that you've fallen into? Is it a publishing demand? It seems like I've fallen into it. I uh, I think a lot had to do with, uh, I've always been kind of productive. I haven't, uh, I don't spend a lot of time by the pool with little umbrella drinks, you know. Eight or nine hours a day of that is enough, which leads me to a lot of time to write. And uh, uh, when I departed Random House I, and went with the new publisher, it was such an enthusiastic and creative team of people here at Thomas and Mercer that I just sort of fell into this two books a year routine. And I'm uh, I'm having so much fun that why not do it? Um, otherwise, I just become a problem for my wife and uh, <laughs> an irritation to the neighbors so uh. <laughs> yeah yeah and then if you're irritating the neighbors then they might call the cops which as we said a minute ago is what you're trying to avoid so it's, it's all making sense you make one wrong step and all of life falls apart so i'll just stay at the key one <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean you said that with the bad weathered friend that it's in a more comic mode. Now, when we were talking about writing previously, you said that some of your early loves were like Steve Allen and Mad Magazine. And so you were very much in into comedy and the comic scene. So I'm wondering, I mean, you've obviously written in such a variety of genres, but When you're writing, let's say, a comic novel or a suspense novel, do you have to get into a different space, um, whether physically or mentally? Well, uh, the the bad weather friend is uh, comic and suspense. So I'm sort of bridging all of that. We're not uh, getting rid of the suspense, but... uh, after I delivered that one, I was, it, it is pretty funny. At the same time, it's suspenseful. And I thought, mm, I wonder how the publisher's going to handle that. And my agent reads it first. And he came back and said, I adore this book and seemed to like it more than anything I'd done. And that was the publisher. Uh, my editor said, give us more of this. So I'm now working on a book called Going Home in the Dark, which is, comic and suspense all over again. And uh, 
the only thing is, I think I'm naturally, uh, I, I've been to seeing everything in life as comic. Even tragic things, if you let enough time go by, usually months, sometimes years, uh, uh, there is always something comic in no matter what happens. It's just the nature of the human condition. Uh, if you look at the story of Job, uh, it, it's funny after the fact, uh, not so much while he's going through it all, but uh, you think, uh, what was God thinking here? Uh, and it's, uh, you, uh, you find something to laugh about in all of it. <clears throat> I like that when I'm writing. If I can be sitting in the office and keep that suspense edge, but also be laughing out loud, that's a great way to be spending the day. And uh, that's what I've been doing lately. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you've said as well that when you sit down to write a novel, you don't, you don't, I mean, we, we know that you don't plan. All it seems you know going in is the opening scene. Mm -hmm. But do you have a sense? tonally as to what the aesthetic of the novel will be and if not i presume that by the time you finish that first chapter you're like okay now i know whether this is veering more towards the comic or the serious for want of a better word yeah it's uh you have to fall into the right rhythm you don't want it to be so comic that Nobody will find anything suspenseful, uh, nor so suspenseful that nothing seems amusing about it. Uh, so, and that, this book, Going Home in the Dark, is somewhat different than the last one that had a comic element. Uh, so I've had to step carefully with it. Um, but one thing I love about writing, no matter which, uh, which kind of mix of genres you're working in, is, uh, Moments like uh, one that happened yesterday. I, <clears throat> uh, it's a story of these friends who all were raised in this little town and they've all gone their separate ways, but they were all outcasts when they were in a school. And when they were in uh, freshman in high school or maybe eighth grade, they, uh, they came together against the rest of the world and they called themselves the four amigos. Uh, and it's one girl and three guys. And, they, three of them have gone out into the world and made a success of their lives. And one has stayed back in Maple Grove, this little town in the heartland. And one day they all get a call that their friend has fallen into a coma and may not be expected to live. And they all come back uh, in case he doesn't make it. But as they all come back, they all start to think, hmm, huh, there was a time in their life when we knew a lot of people who fell into comas but they don't know what they're talking about. So it turns out, of course, there's something in their past that they've all been made to forget. And as they get back into this town to see their friend who falls in a coma, he seems to die, except they all look at each other and know he's not dead. He has no vital signs, but he's not dead. And this has happened before. And we've got to get him out of this hospital before the mortician shows up and wants to embalm him. So one thing I love about this kind of story is there was a moment where they got to get the, he's in a hospital again, they got to get him dressed. They got to get a wheelchair to get him out of there on before the mortician shows up. And there's a little moment where a guy, one of the three that hasn't fallen into a coma goes to find a wheelchair and something happens. This is, where these stories become a lot of fun. He's supposed to get a wheelchair, but he falls into an argument with somebody about hats. Uh, and it's so absurd, and yet it's very comic and very suspenseful because, by God, they need that wheelchair, and the mortician is coming. And one of the things that can work so well about mixing, mixing the comedy and the suspense is if it's done right, and I'm patting myself on the back, uh, I think it's being done right. The comic moments can, in this essence, heighten the suspense because you're laughing at what's happening. And yet, you know, they need that wheelchair very urgently. So I'm just having a great time. I hope somebody else who reads this has a great time. But you know what? I'm 78. So damn it. 
if they don't have a good time, I'm still having fun at this end of the process. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about, I mean, you have to write something for yourself. You have to write something where you're enjoying it because, goodness, if you're not enjoying it, then it will show. The reader will not enjoy it if you're bored or if it's kind of reined in. Uh, absolutely, they won't enjoy it, and they'll write you about not enjoying it. So <laughs> I, I particularly don't like that. Uh, so I don't, uh, I don't want to have to track down and threaten any reader who didn't like the book. So it's better that you write it such that they do like it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that that is the traditional way to stop getting bad reviews. You just track down the reader and have a strong word. <laughs> I, I know of, of a writer, he's no longer with us. His name was Harlan Ellison. Harlan was a volatile human yes. being, and, and apparently no. And fairly early in his career, some critic, uh, he lived in, here in California, some critic on the East Coast, savaged a book he'd written. So Harlan got on a plane, flew back to the town this critic lived in, trapped him down, locked on his door, and punched him. Uh, I'm not that kind of personality, so I don't want to have to go there. But. As someone familiar with Harlan Ellison, both <laughs> the writer and the legend, this story does not surprise me in the <laughs> least. No, it no. feels fitting. Goodness. He was Harlan, built differently. <laughs> yes, he was. Every time Harlan would call me, I would tense up not knowing what was coming next. If he was going to say, I'm going to be in town, I want to come see you, I got very tense. But it always turned out okay. Uh, yeah. And I have to say, with the book that you're writing at the moment that you just described with the coma and the people around the hospital bed, like I, I am totally sold on that. I want to read that. <laughs> right mm -hmm. now but it i i guess then with the timeline that means that what it will be out in a few years is that the kind of that, that's me just assuming we're steadily putting out two books a year uh <clears throat> the bad weather friend comes out in january next year then a novel that i finished but we're working none of us like the title that's on it and we've come up with a few others, so we're brooding about titles. That comes out in July of next year. So Going Home in the Dark will come out in uh, January 2025. Uh, so it's a while to wait, but I still don't have it done. So it'll finish about October. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of titles, do you typically come up with them at the end? Do you come up with them at the beginning? When does the title come into play? It varies at different times. Uh, after Death, the one that just came out, that was that hit me as I was starting the book and I realized it was too good a title not to use. So that was there all the way through the book. That weather friend was called something else. I won't even say what it was called. It sounds incomprehensible. And I knew nobody was going to like it, but uh, I couldn't think of anything else. And then during when I finished the book, uh, I thought, ah, there's this the story in that one is about a guy who is just too nice. He's too nice for the world as it's gotten because niceness doesn't get you much anywhere these days. And as the book opens, his whole life is falling apart. And uh, and he gets this inheritance from an uncle in Florida. And the inheritance comes in this enormous box that's eight feet long and four feet wide and three feet deep. And it's no surprise that what's in the box is uh, is something a little bit supernatural. And I won't go into what is in the box. But he's told at one point by someone who comes out of the box that uh, you're just too nice and people as nice as you are, uh, you know, their, their lives just get ruined and you're never going to be less than nice. So it's my job to make sure that the people who want to destroy your life 
never get the opportunity to do it. And uh, when we finished the book, and nobody had liked the title but loved the book, uh, I suddenly looked at it and said, at one point, this person who comes out of the box says to him, uh, a lot of the friends in your life are going to be bad weather friends. Thought only they are, are going to be good weather friends. They're only there when everything is going well. And you've seen that all of these friends are sliding away from you. Now that all this trouble is befalling you, I will always be your bad weather friend. And as soon as that came across my head, I said, Whoa, the title's already in the novel and we just have to pull it out. And fortunately, everybody liked that. We've developed a cover that I just love. It looks very threatening, but very funny at the same time. There's a hulking figure against a kind of gothic background holding a small yellow umbrella mm. in the main. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it just strikes exactly the right note. Yeah, and, yeah. That's... Yeah, and uh, the one after now just is a little harder to title, but Going Home in the Dark, the one I'm working on, as soon as I got that title, I knew that one worked. So. Yeah, and I mean, that, that cover sounds like it tonally captures you know, a certain brand of your fiction. I mean, obviously, we know that there are some where there are a, a few less laughs in them, but typically <laughs> that there's humor. And I mean, I, I think that ties in quite nicely to the brand new book, After Death. It is out today, available via Amazon. So, I mean, it, it, it sounds like there's uh, quite a lot thematically going on in your mind at the moment in terms of people dying, but not actually dying, coming back in <laughs> some way. Yeah, I didn't realize that's similar. It's a totally different story, but it, the two books do have that element. Yeah. Uh, After Death um, is about, a, uh, well, that it's really about something else. It's, uh, I've been reading for years, uh, people like Ray Kurzweil and uh, people in the sciences and the high tech world who are all charged up about the singularity. Uh, <clears throat> there's a number of definitions of that that are slightly different one from the other. But it basically is that there will come a point, many say by 2030, when humanity and machines will meld in one way or another, or at least the technology will advance to the point that human lifespan will drastically increase. Our intelligence, because we'll be married to machine ability, will soar, and all these wonderful things will happen. Uh, and when I read uh, one of these, it said, our intelligence will leap 100 to 1,000 fold overnight. I said, okay, this is all fantasy. Human beings aren't capable of that level of uh, intelligence. We'd have to have heads four times the size they are. And we don't evolve that instantly. Uh, but it made me start to think what exactly might happen in the singularity. And our lead character is a guy who's working somewhere. He's head of security for a research place where they literally are working on a way to get this man-machine meld that will allow us to have maybe a computer that melted into the brain to enhance us that way either all those fantasies that they talk about. But I came up with something that happens for this character and it's the only thing that happens. He doesn't become super smart. He doesn't become a superhero. He doesn't become above death. He dies once, but he comes back. He's the only, everyone in the research facility dies. He's the only one that comes back. And he has one ability uh, and it's interesting. And I thought, okay, I think that's something that might happen. But now what does he do? And that's where the book begins and takes off. Yeah. And I mean, going into this book, how much did you know about the singularity and how much did you then have to delve deeper into it, knowing that, okay, I'm now writing a novel you know, where this is the, not even thematically a concern, but it, it's integral to the book. Yeah, and I didn't want it to be science fictional in its nature. I wanted it to be set 
in the real world our day, and this one thing he can do gives him an advantage, but he could still die. Uh, and this time when he dies, he isn't coming back. Uh, he's not like a cat. Uh, so his, his dying and coming back is a limited arrangement. Uh, so I wanted it to, to have a mission and to be a real world thing. Uh, but I did have to think pretty solidly about how I would visualize this ability that he gets. Because I wanted the reader not just to say, oh, okay, that sounds interesting, but how would it actually work? So I, that was the biggest thing. It wasn't research so much. It was just trying to visualize it and then visualize it for the reader. But I think that's happened. Of course, here I am again, patting myself on the back. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. And I mean, of course, another concern thematically, as was the case with The House at the End of the World, again, two completely different books here, but we're talking about corruption, we're talking about power, we're talking about inequality and how this occurs at every single level. It's, uh, I don't think I'll ever get done writing about the, the power of power to corrupt. Um, mm. Because we're living in a world where we see it getting to be a bigger problem almost yeah. daily uh, <clears throat> in our politics, in our corporate world, in media, everywhere you look, power is being agglomerated and not to the benefit of the rest of us. <laughs> and uh, so that'll probably be part of a lot of what I write uh, henceforward, although it's not going to be the single thing. But in this book, there are some really pretty nasty people. Uh, and uh, it's always fun to write, to write about really nasty people, uh, especially if you're not capable of being one yourself. <laughs> it's, uh, hmm, what would I do if I was somebody with no moral compass whatsoever? Uh, but then again, as I think I might have said to you before, I don't want to make them romantic. I, I mm. want to have that sort of comic side to them because uh, embracing power ultimately leads to disaster. And so people who think that it is the end all and be all are basically fools. So it becomes my job to show you how they're foolish, even as it seems they are, are going to triumph. Yeah. And I, I think that there certainly isn't any romanticizing of you know the, the villain for want of better phrasing and it it's interesting too how you you manage to make the story both political and apolitical at the same time because you're completely critical of power of politics of the system but without taking any side it's like we are just stating this is these are the facts here this is the corruption it it is all corrupt <laughs> it's inequality at every level here somebody's just said to me uh, uh in a, another interview uh you, you often have uh, people in authority police or fbi or whatever uh, in the jane ock series it was the fbi uh, you uh, you don't seem to trust any of them like that. And I said, no, actually, I, I have a respect for police. And I think there are a lot of good people in all of those. But it tends to be that the people that gravitate to the top of all those organizations are the ones you have to watch out for, it seems. And then it suddenly dawned on me. I said, you know what this is? Uh, I grew up. Uh, as I've spoken about before, under the thumb of a violent alcoholic father. And I suddenly was reminded of this interview I did. First time I ever did a press interview uh, was when Watchers was about to come out. It was the first time any major media was interested. And People Magazine sent a reporter, and they, in those days, people did longer stories instead of 300 little bits per page. And uh, the reporter did a nice job, but then they sent a photographer, and his name was Jim McHugh. And uh, he came for a day and he ended up staying too. And after a couple of hours of trying to take my photo, 
uh, he said, oh, let's sit down and relax and put our feet up and, and just chat for a while. Uh, we don't have to do this uh, all day. and We'll come back to it in an hour or so. And I thought, I didn't know. I mean, the first time I'd ever been photographed, so I didn't know. And we sat down and talked a little bit. And then he said, I'm going to tell you some things about your life that you wouldn't think I know. And I said, oh, okay, a fortune teller. Uh, but he said, one or both of your parents were alcoholics and one or both of your parents were violent. And well, that was my father. And, but I had never spoken of it and I didn't understand how he could have possibly known that. And he said, I said, well, how would you know that? I've never re revealed it publicly. I just don't talk about it. He said, I grew up on, with parents who were both alcoholics and there was violence from my father. And he said, as an adult, I have gone to adult children of alcoholics classes and I've learned there's behaviors that those of us who grew up under that all exhibit and you're exhibiting all of them. And I said, what, what behavior? And he said, number one, you're very nice. You're very polite. You are very uh, pleasant to be around. But the moment I took out the cambia, you've been quietly trying to set up every shot. You don't want me to choose the shots. You're going to choose how the shots are done. And that you probably are like that in most things in your life. And that's because as a child, you had no control. You never knew what was going to happen one day or the next because of who your father was. And you said to yourself in childhood, either subconsciously or consciously, when I grow up, by God, I'm going to have control of my life. And you really do. He said, you probably also don't fly. I said, I used to not fly. I used to fly, but I haven't flown in many years. He said, whatever caused it, that wasn't the basic cause. The basic cause was at some point you recognize you don't know the pilot and therefore you're trusting your life to a stranger. And that was sort of like trusting it to your father. And it was one of the most amazing conversations I've ever had. And he was <clears throat> entirely correct. And it's behavior you can't change. Uh, you're stuck with it. So then as I was in this interview the other day, when that issue arose, I said, you know what? That's one big reason so many of the villains in the books I write are figures of authority because I don't like not having control or ceding authority to strangers. So that's probably why so many of the books have that. Yeah, yeah. And when you, know, you had this conversation with Jim, how how did it kind of make you feel going forward? I mean, because I can imagine on one hand, you might feel seen for want of better phrasing. It's like, okay, so people can almost see, see this trauma and this past experience without me having to communicate anything. But then at the same time, it's almost like, wait, I didn't tell you anything. I'm I'm exposed here. I'm not sure if I like this. That you know that, that this is going on. Did did it affect you in either of these ways? Did you then try to modify your behaviors? It's like, well, I'll show you. Then I won't <laughs> behave in that way, even though naturally that's how I want to. I I did end up that thing allowing him to take a photo. I really didn't want to be taken because I knew it was going to make me look stupid. Uh, mm. And that's not the most difficult thing to begin with. Uh, and he, uh, he, his, the magazine said uh, they wanted him to take a photo of me with holding an ax or holding a knife or something like that. And I refused to do anything hokey like that. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but finally, he said, could I take you just to please my editor? And we won't use this picture. Now, I've learned that every time they tell you, we won't use this picture. That will be the picture they use because it makes you look the most interesting, as they put it. But actually, it makes you look the most ridiculous. Uh, and he, I thought, well, he wanted to take my picture 
with spooky trees behind me. And I, you know, it was autumn and the bare limb trees and stuff. And I said, oh, okay, I'll bend that far. I'll just show him that I can cede control to him more easily than he thinks. And he said, and I'd also like to shoot up at you. And I was naive then, which is a very bad thing. Never let, let them shoot up at you. It distorts the whole mm. look of the uh, So I did. And sure enough, that was the photo I used. It was on two pages, a two-page spread at the beginning of the article. And when the magazine out, came out, my editor at the paperback house where I was published at that time, Susan Allison, one of the nicest people I've ever known in publishing, retired now. Uh, she said, she called me up and said, well, if I didn't know you, I wouldn't know that was you in that photograph. She said, you look like a very dangerous, semi-psychotic biker. <laughs> and I said, that's exactly what I look like. And that isn't actually who I am. But I did give Jim a little bit of control. Now, the one reason I didn't think everybody now knows me for what I am is Jim only knew that because he went through these classes for dark, dark children of alcoholics. So I figured there are those people who look at me and say, ah, but most people don't do that. They, they look at me and see something that isn't real. Yeah, and I, I guess the fact that then it probably means the only people who would rec would have recognized you as that had also been through a similar experience in in a bizarre way there's a kind of safety from that there's a kinship and you don't really have to explain things which i'm sure is tiresome to kind of have to recount anyway and probably unpleasant or certainly was at the time when there wasn't so much distance between it it's uh, once or twice since that experience when I've met somebody and got to know them a little bit, but not so much. I can see the same behavior that Jim saw in me and that I now see in myself. And one time I, I said, you know, I think I can tell you something about your past. And, and sure enough, in that instance, I startled this person just as much as Jim had startled me. Uh, but I've never done it again because I thought it wouldn't have been very nice if they'd said, what are you talking about? My father was a pastor and a very wonderful man. Uh, then I would have felt like an idiot. So I've, I've not made use of that knowledge since. Yeah, I guess if you're going to say to someone, one of your parents was a violent alcoholic, that's a shot you don't want to miss. You've got to be pretty confident at that point. <laughs> You probably should have film of it before you leave them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know if we need to go that far, but <laughs> that, is, that, that would make an interesting book, I think. So there, there's, something, <laughs> there's something in that for sure. But, I mean, when, when you're talking about, you know, a, a situation where they wanted to take these photographs, give you an axe, make it quite hokey, I mean, this comes back to the idea that over the years you have been classified as a horror author found your work in the horror section of bookstores but to the best of my knowledge you've never actually self-identified as a horror author in fact quite the opposite that you know on all the branding you are a suspense author you have written elements of horror you've written elements of science fiction you've honestly written elements of everything so i mean i'm wondering firstly what do you think distinguishes a suspense author from a horror author and how do you feel about this relentless pursuit of bookstores and magazines and the media to try and categorize you as a horror author? Well, I don't, I don't like any labels, actually. I don't even like the suspense label. I started out writing uh, science fiction, and when I got 
I wasn't very good at it, but I did publish a number of novels. And when I realized I was never going to be doing more than second-rate genre work in that field that was pure science fiction uh, set in far futures and that, and I realized this isn't what I am going to be any good at. Uh, I had to, I had, may have told you before, I had to buy back all the novels that I had published under science fiction, which is a very unfortunate circumstance to uh, have to buy back what, and pay them what they paid you just to get out of it. And yet, Years later, I was, I had gone on, I had written a comic novel, I'd written a lot of suspense novels, and I would have a new novel come out, and I'd get a review, more than one, uh, that would say, ah, here's something different from this science fiction writer, and I hadn't written science fiction in 15 years. So I became very sensitive about any labels, because they trying to crowd you into a narrow alley in publishing, generally speaking, and don't want to let you out. Uh, and uh, But suspense is one I could live with. Uh, and what I often say to justify it is, hey, every novel that's any good from Dickens to Mickey Spillane has suspense in it because that's the basic quality of our lives. We never know what's going to happen to us tomorrow or an hour from now, uh, or uh, a week from now. So we live in a constant state of suspense. We just deny it. And therefore, I can accept this suspense label. Because uh, they want to put one label or another on you. Uh, I've noticed that Amazon will put you in different categories of interest. They will, when it's released, they'll say, oh, if it has a romance in it, they will say, here's a love story, here's a suspense novel, here's this. Here's a sci-fi novel. Here's a horror novel, and I think that's kind of wise. But uh, you know, I'm just—I uh, I grew up in high school with uh, the label sort of nerd, and so that made me sensitive to the labels pretty early on. Yeah, yeah, and I like that. You know, your solution to labels is like well okay i'll accept a label but a label that actually by definition is a non-label because as you say suspense can be be in anything so yeah it's my cunning way of getting around it yeah yeah and i mean we're going to bounce around between different topics we need to go back to after death and i i think we've just got to talk a little bit about the apple orchard scene or the extended scene because it you know we we come back to it again and again but that there is talking about a multitude of genres there are a multitude of genres in this one scene because there is comedy there is suspense there is a hell of a lot of tension there's some surreal laugh out loud moments, you know, bit between uh, some some of the characters, and I mean, you you pulled this all off masterfully. But were there any concerns going into it? And I mean, how much did you have to go over this scene to get it right? It was uh, I, I I'll honestly reveal I going into the apple ocean. I knew it was a big scene. I didn't realize how big it was going to become and how much was going to occur in the apple orchard and the buildings that service. It's a dead apple orchard, which is yeah. on its own kind of... Um, uh, and there's in Central California now, there are areas where because of water shortages and bad management by the state government, uh, some historic orchards are just dead uh, and mm. they're very uh, strange places if you knew them the way they were. So it struck me as a great place to have an extended spooky uh, scene. And then this is a book with more than one villain. You know, <laughs> there's uh, aside from the uh, government agent, uh, Caliphus, who is, uh, is pretty vile. There is, uh, there are a number of, gangbangers uh, mm. from uh, the equivalent of the Crips or the Blood. They call themselves the Vigs. 
And uh, I, I knew at some point there was going to be a big showdown in this orchard. Uh, but when I got into it, the, the, uh, you know, that's one of the great things that's fun. You get into something and you think, oh, this is probably like a 12 page scene. <laughs> And suddenly, 40 pages later, you're still here and, uh, and you haven't even touched some of the things that could occur in this. Uh, that's, that is when writing gets a lot of fun because uh, it's, uh, they, you, you didn't recognize all the opportunities you were going to have for tension in this sequence. But these, uh, these gangbangers uh, are, it's also fun to have uh, them in this novel because I like capturing uh, uh, the way characters talk in different social strata. And uh, I, that was a thing I had fun with in the Jane Hawk books. And here it gave me some real places to have it because when you're dealing with ultra violent gang members who are ultra violent, um, you don't want to run into these people in real life, especially not after having written about them as I mm. did. Uh, and uh, however, they are ultimate fools because this is a dead end kind of life. Literally, you're going to end up dead more likely than not before you reach any advanced age. And uh, that opens the door to all sorts of comic elements within those scenes. Uh, so I'm happy you like that sequence. Uh, it was uh, it was touchy to write about because there's a lot of death in that sequence, and uh, and there's a lot of threat to the characters we like. But at the same time, some things happen. Uh, I don't want to give much away, but mm. there's uh, there's uh, some event that happens related to their cell phones, which. Uh, which our lead character has been able to take control of. And uh, that had me laughing out loud at one point. Um, so uh, I had a lot of fun in that book, and I guess you noticed that. Yeah, yeah. No, that, there was something I wanted to reference, <laughs> but because of what you said about the cell phones, I now can't reference it but i can in a very obtuse way say to you that you made me think of something that used to be in popular media that i haven't thought about for the last 20 or 30 years and we we can't say anymore because it might give it away but uh pe people will know when they get to that scene what i'm talking about the the imagery that is so it's so powerful because and here's the thing whether whether you love this piece of media or you hate this piece of media for it to actually happen to these characters at the moment that they're at you would realize that you would be the most annoyed that you've ever been in your entire life it's like this is like the epitome of being like extremely pissed off for this happened at the wrong time and everyone's happening. And so it's like, it was so, it was grand. It was, it was, a, it was a grand centerpiece to, to a massive set piece that, that really just makes the whole book. I loved yeah. it. Well, you know, when you're writing novels uh, and, and you've hit upon, uh, I don't know why I didn't realize initially how large the whole Apple Orchard sequence would be because you're always looking for some, environment, some place to set a dramatic sequence that's different, that you haven't used before, you haven't seen before, and that offers you all kinds of opportunities. And that apple orchard and the associated buildings gives you atmosphere, uh, different kind of backdrops, and, and just some grand stuff to work with. So I should have known going in that this was going to give me all kinds of opportunities. Uh, but in case of that also with these very bad guys, when this media we're not going to mention, when this moment intrudes on them, they're horribly embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the big fun for me, was these real bad guys, they're humiliated by this. And I was laughing out loud through that whole little sequence, all through that part of it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I... 
I hope that we get a film version of this because to see that visually would just be, <laughs> yeah, that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> we, we are entertaining a film offer right now from uh, somebody who uh, actually made a deal for the house at the end of the world. And then this is a producer I know uh, mm. from the past and whom I like very much as a person. Uh, we never got anything produced together before, but uh, but he's, he's quite a lot of fun. And so he said, what's the next one? After he got together with the studio and made a deal for the house at the end of the world. And I said, well, it's this thing called After Death. And he said, I want to see it. And I said, well, I, I don't think you're going to want to do two things on a row. This one's kind of different in some ways, but I sent him an advanced proof of it. And he read it over a weekend and he called me up and said, I have to do this. <laughs> so uh, now he's back with the same studio, actually. And they loved it. And they're supposed to be making a deal. But we'll see. That almost seems too good to be true. Because this guy will know how to do both these books and to do them well. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I I wonder too, and it might be something that you can't really talk about, but being with Amazon Publishing, I mean, does that open up opportunities because Amazon are you know, streaming and producing content. Do, I, I guess being published by Amazon, does that give you more access to the potential video options or are these two arms of Amazon just completely disconnected so it isn't, you know, so, something that they can do? Because, I, I mean, it, it seems like as an outsider looking in, I mean, Amazon are trying to diversify in as many ways as they can so it would make sense that if you've got the publishing rights that you're going to look at other media rights too you would think so but <laughs> uh the uh so far no i have uh uh i think it's yeah it's 15 books in development as tv series or films including the eight odd thomas novels which another mm. producer has make, made a deal with uh and none of them are in Amazon Prime. So uh, that opportunity would seem to be there. I sometimes think that when a company is very large and they have different divisions, the divisions become little kingdoms. And the people in this little kingdom don't want the people in this little kingdom thinking they can tell them what to do. I don't know. Uh, Amazon Prime has made some things, or Amazon Studios has made some things I've liked quite a while. So I would hope they maybe one day uh, come along, but so far not. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, we said before that with After Death, we've got three worlds here. We've got the world of the rich and the elite. We've got the hood. We've also, in terms of place, got Eden, which serves as an in-between. But then, in addition to having these three worlds, I mean... The, the hood and the life that Nina and John have is very different to the life that the gangbangers have. I mean, they're trying to avoid that. They're trying to get away from that. So, I mean, what kind of things went into writing about all of these different areas did you physically go to any of these areas? I mean, we spoke before how luckily Google Maps means that you don't actually have to do that if you don't want to. I have, uh, it's many years, but I've been in South Central a couple of times, which is a center of game in, uh, mm. well, one of the centers in the Los, larger Los Angeles area. Uh, but no, I, I, ch I chose not to put my life at risk uh, by going to the actual locale. Having seen it and having Googled it, my uh, response to refresh my memory, uh, I didn't really need to do that. But when I was in the very early stages of the book, uh, the book opens with the scene of our lead character coming through Beverly Hills at after midnight uh, on foot. And that's nothing that anybody does without drawing the attention of the police in a minute. Nobody is on foot 
in uh, uh, Beverly Hills residential areas that doesn't get noticed. So he's, I had him moving through that, but I knew he was, you know, he had this, this ability that was going to be rather striking and, and people were going to be after him because they knew that he had been dead and now was back and the people behind this experiment and the federal government weren't going to get their hands on him. But there was going to have to be some mission he was on, uh, some reason for us to care about what he was going to be doing aside from his own survival. And this is giving something away in the beginning, but it's minor because it's so toward the front. His best friend in the world was in that same uh, operation, that same project, and died. And that friend had a woman that he was too almost shy to approach. And this woman is, lives in South Central, has a son, and she's trying to get that son, make sure he never gets into the, involved in the gang, which it so happens his father is a member of. Mm. And, uh, and that gives us some heart in the story. And our lead character wants to do what his dead friend couldn't achieve or didn't have time to achieve in his life as to rescue this woman and this boy. And, uh, and that sort of brings all the worlds together in this and, and gives it a kind of variety of place. And uh, I think I'm answering your question. Maybe not. Maybe I just got lost in the woods as I tried to. Uh, but it, it did give me a lot of varied backgrounds to uh, to resort to during the course of the story. Yeah, I, I think that you answered the question or at least provided some interesting insight. And as you say, you don't want to get lost in those woods, particularly if it's a, a dead apple orchard that ain't somewhere to, <laughs> to be staying. And in a thunderstorm, too, you know. That's yeah. Yeah, it can't just yeah. be a bad apple orchard. There has to be lightning and thunder and rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And I mean, with that scene, as you said, like in total, it's over forty pages. But I mean, it it both it both does. And doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it in a positive way because, of course, you're breaking it up. That you are still, whilst you've got that, you've still got these short chapters that you're becoming known for. And so it's pacey. You're cutting away. And I mean, I guess that's that that seems to be how to do it because i i've had times before where i've written <laughs> scenes of similar length i'm kind of battling with that at the moment and it's like i can't keep this 40 page <laughs> scene of this one event in but you know reading this it inspired me it's like no you cut away from it if you cut away and you put other points of view in then you totally can. You just probably shouldn't write a 40 or 50 page <laughs> extended scene with no cutaway. Yeah, it's uh, that that's the benefit in a scene like that of having multiple villains. There's not just one gang member after them, it's several. Uh, and then you've got Nina and her son who are the, uh, on their own in this apple orchard. But our lead character knows where they are and is on his way to get to them uh, before the gang members do. So you've got all these different viewpoints and it, it keeps it fresh. It's something I've learned over the years that uh, being able to cut away to multiple points of view where there's something dramatic happening in all of them. Uh, with the gangbangers in that scene, things are going wrong for them and they don't know why and it's making them angry and more violent. And then with Nina and her son, they're trying to hide in this complex of buildings at the heart of the orchard and they've got their own concerns. And then uh, our, our lead is they're uh, trying to get to them and, and rescue them. So it, it's not just cutting away to the same thing. They've all got different concerns and different things happening to them. And uh, that also just keeps me as a writer uh, more interested in the sequence 
uh, because it, then it becomes, it's kind of like juggling a series of balls. And how do you switch? Where do you switch? Why do you grab this ball and that one in this order? And uh, that can be quite challenging and fun, actually, because you know you've got a lot of material up here. So for a while, you're not going to be thinking, what next? You're thinking, okay, how do I get all this together and do it? And that becomes in some ways easier and more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how you, you bring in kind of late in the game. And these, these two guys are going to stick in my head as Juan and Walter. <laughs> and they provide to me like some of that, that I guess that high tension comic relief. And they, they, you know, they come in late. They're, they're not done on it, not in very long, but I feel like I've known these guys and, you know, and it's like, I've known people like them. They're very, very relatable. And that's, I think that's one of the, the most powerful things about your writing is you can bring a character in so late and they, they're like fully fleshed out. Bam, here you go. And you got these two guys and, and they're, they're, they're completely unpredictable. I'd love to see like a whole book with these two guys. Cause I can, I can imagine they could, they could probably, you know, if you're talking about something that's going to be comedic and suspenseful, well, those two guys are probably going to be, <laughs> they could definitely do something. <laughs> now you put a seed of an idea in my head. <laughs> my, my head. Uh, they, they also on the altar, uh, uh, when they come in where they do, uh, I had fun with the characters. I liked their relationship. I liked where they are in their lives and why they're out here at night doing what mm -hmm. they're doing. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it was necessary for me to, you've got your lead character and these people he's rescuing and a very bad guy coming after them. And you've got this other element, I won't say what it is, right. that our lead is using that is on its way to help them, but it's mm -hmm. gonna have to get there. And what you always want to do in a book is not let that element that's going to help them get there too quickly. Part of the suspense is, will it get there at all? And if it does, will it get there too late? Uh, so then there has to be something makes it difficult for that element that's coming to the rescue to mm -hmm. get there. And that's Juan and Walter. So they're also a little comic relief at a moment of high suspense. But they're also like inhibiting uh, the rescue of our lead characters. So yeah. it's that's where the little characters coming in by surprise, the reader hasn't seen them before, but it's logical they would be out there. And they come in just when they're needed, but they start, they give you again uh, a cutaway thing to cut away mm -hmm. to and build that suspense. That's what I'm always looking for. Uh, and it, it's a it's a tricky thing to do, but it, it is a technique that ninety nine percent of the time works. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that we'd have no problem filling an hour once again, and indeed, as happened previously, we've got so much more that we could talk about. But <clears throat> I wonder, do you have time for a few? Patreon questions. We we seem to be very good at selling them short and <laughs> being like, sorry, patrons. We <laughs> we spoke to Dean sure. greedily for an hour <laughs> for ourselves. I can, I can stick for some of that, yeah. Okay. So Robert Stahl wants to know what do you think has been the most influential factor in the development of your unique writing voice? Ah, that's an interesting question. For one, well, two things come to mind. One, as a reader, I've always read everything. I don't read just in one or two narrow genres. I read all, in all kinds of fiction. And I've read a lot of it. So a lot of different influences came in. Uh, the other thing I think, and I've been forced to think about this the older I get, I think one of the big influences is just a certain little stubbornness in my personality. 
that when I'm told by a publisher or an agent or an editor, you can't do that, then I have to prove that you can. <laughs> that's where I started crossing genres because nobody back then was doing it. That's where I started introducing comedy into suspense when I was told that you can't get away with that. You'll lose the suspense reader. And when I look back on it, it was being told, no, 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 you can't do that. And I would go, yeah, just watch. Let's see if I can. Uh, that had a profound uh, influence on in where I ended up. Yeah. So it seems like if people tell you you can't do something, then my goodness, you are going to do your damnedest to do it. I, you know, I haven't murdered anybody just because it says thou shalt not murder. But, uh, you know, within the writing world, yeah, that seems to way a way to motivate me. Yeah. So there are limits, particularly the Ten Commandments. So apart from the Ten Commandments, it's <laughs> don't tell Dean he can't do it. Yeah, that's I think that's a fair judgment. Yeah. Yeah. But it, this is progress because in the last interview you confirmed you hadn't murdered a child and today you've confirmed you haven't murdered anyone so I know. <laughs> I know i'm wondering about that uh, yeah <laughs> it, it's always good to clarify <laughs> but we, we don't lead with it it's not an opening question it <laughs> might you know make the guest a little bit uncomfortable an hour in well if it's awkward we're gonna end it soon anyway so no worries We've got a question from Alice Phelan, who says, how has your religious faith influenced your process and has it ever caused any controversial responses from either the horror or Catholic communities? <laughs> I've never had any uh, problem that way. And I've never had a problem from readers either saying, oh, I don't like the idea that there's a belief in these books that life has meaning and purpose uh, because I'm not proselytizing. Uh, I, I'm just writing from that perspective and saying this is the way I see the world. It, it has meaning and I'm not going to try to sell my belief to you. I want the story to sort of embody that. And no, uh, I have several friends who are monks and uh, none of them have ever said, you better come to confession. Uh, they know I might not show up anyway, but uh, it's, uh, I just never encountered that. In fact, uh, my friends who are monks are big fans of mine. And I have a number of, of uh, convents in the United States where the nuns are big fans. That started with a book called Life Expectancy. And there's a character in Life Expectancy, Grandma Rowena, uh, who's a cantankerous old woman who is actually a little bit found out. And I began to get letters from nuns saying, here at the convent, we formed a Grandma Rowena uh, club. And I think, wow, isn't that interesting? But uh, no, nope, I've never had any feedback negatively either way. All right. Well, it... It seems then that you obviously tapped into something within the nun community. <laughs> what wasn't a sentence I expected to utter this today, particularly so early, but <laughs> there we are. Well, it doesn't result in millions of new readers who are nuns. There are not quite that many of them, but uh, it's kind of interesting to think that. Uh, I think it's always interesting when you get mail from somebody you never anticipated you were ever going to reach. And I, I, one area that always surprises me is once in a while, I will get a letter from some kid who says, I'm 11 years old, or I'm 12 years old, and I just read this, and I just love this book. And I go, Woo, that's a book 11 year olds probably shouldn't be reading. And then they'll proceed to write this highly articulate letter uh, that could have come from a 40-year-old college professor. And it makes me realize there's all kinds of people out there at all ages that you don't recognize or realize. You're not sitting here writing for, but it's kind of fun to realize that you're, you're, 
You're tapping into some people you would have never imagined picking up the book. Yeah. And as a side note, there's a bizarre alert that has turned up on my Zencaster. Bob, do you have that as well? It says that, it says Dean is having a problem with his audio stream, but it's like, no, he's not. I can hear you. I, I don't understand why this message is, has appeared. No, no, I don't, I don't see anything like that at all. Uh, no. Maybe that's an ominous supernatural warning. Uh, I have to yeah. think the about, spectral uh, presence. Yeah, yeah, spectral presence. <laughs> and it's speaking in code of some kind. I, I'll have to think what that is. Is that a threat, a promise? Uh, I'll think about that. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what it is is actually like maybe your publicist or your assistant has built in <laughs> something right. into the computer. It's like if they go over an hour again, we are <laughs> we are going to stop the microphone. We are going to interfere and well i i suppose then we should reluctantly wrap this one up i mean i'm yeah. i'm hoping you know if if you've enjoyed it and we can do it again then we're, we're just gonna keep the stance because i want to know <laughs> about the next novel too so well yes. i have enjoyed it and that's why I, yeah, my publicists they don't at least as far as I know, they don't have any tricks like that. We'll phone you if it gets out of hand and, and we'll tell you your your Uncle Jim is dying. So they, they're not trying tricks like that, I don't think. Yeah, so the code word is Jim is dead. So if someone <laughs> runs in and says Jim is dead, we know we've <laughs> overstepped. And I mean, it it feels appropriate and an endorsement to mm -hmm. After Death that there is this bizarre interference with technology anyway. <laughs> so, well, you know, I, it had occurred to me over the last month, uh, you know, life plays odd tricks on you. And I was thinking, I just hope I get through publication day because it would have been a very interesting point in the media that, huh, he wrote, published a book called After Death and he died the day before it appeared. Uh, so now I've passed that threat and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, yeah, well, fingers crossed that your health is okay at the moment. We don't want After Death to be <laughs> yeah, the, the final book. Uh, that is not posthumous. That is not the direction we well, want to go in. <laughs> now that it has been published, it can't have been published after my death. So I've escaped that possible irony. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you say that, but we also know that you like to kind of mess about with time and it not being so linear. We also know that you're um, into, not into Lazarus, but you write about such things. So, I mean, we'll have to take your word for it that you have not, in fact, died. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm here. And I'm yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. and you have no way of checking the veracity of that. So yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Uh, final thoughts? I thought we just got done with that. Uh, no, I I don't want to go where the final thoughts are. I intend to think and write for a long time yet. <laughs>